This is Duke University. In two or three generations, at the horizon of 2050, each African family will have a niece or nephew uh, in Europe. I want to give you some, as my argument is about the human geography of Africa, I want to give you some, uh, the backdrop of uh, what I understand by human geography. I prefer that expression to demographics. Uh, demographics are dry, there's a lot of numbers. Some of them I can't spare you, but I try to be humane on that. Uh, I'm not so much interested in an overall population growth, Malthusian angst and uh, uh, overall figures, but much more into population age structure, the structure of age pyramids and how uh, dependency ratios work out who the active population, the older cohort and the younger cohort the, and the dependency among them and how that influences uh, societies. In, in very many ways, migration is only one of them. The moment, the event that inspired my little bit provocative title about the scramble for Europe, after the scramble for Africa, obviously, which is linked to the Berlin Conference. At that moment, there are 200 million people in Africa, so just 50 million more than uh, two and a half centuries early on. And then comes the final demographic accident in Africa, which is the so-called colonial encounter. And it's not about ill intent or uh, uh, colonial abuse. It is about pathogens. A third of the population in West Africa, I speak about West Africa as the European understanding of West Africa. For, for us, all of that is West Africa. But uh, a third of that population is wiped out and half of the population of Central Africa through the colonial encounter, the fact that new pathogens enter the, the continent. And over the period from the Berlin Conference to the First World War, uh, to 1930, so in between the two world wars, the population of Africa would go down from 200 million to 150 million. So not only does it not grow over half a century, but it actually loses 25%. Uh, and from now on, Africa will be the place with the most significant demographic growth ever recorded in human history, the fastest urbanization ever recorded in human history, and the concentration of young people that has never been existed on this planet before. Now, I said 150 million in the mid-1930s. Uh, uh, Today, as you know, Africa is 1.3 billion. So this is an eight-time increase since 1930 in population. And the population will double again by 2050 when it will stand at 2.5 billion. Africa is growing younger and younger. For the time being, all of Africa, 40% of the population is under the age of 15. Every 15, 16, 17 years, half of the population is renewed. Now, I want to explain how that population increase translates into a perpetual uh, rejuvenation, if I can call it that way. It is linked to the movement of people. So people are, um, are moving from the villages. So you have the rural exodus, exodus or urban drift. Massively, people have been leaving the villages from the 1930s, are moving to the towns. At the beginning, we very often understood that purely economically, looking for better life chances, opportunities, etc. I think they were also running away from the tutelary presence of elderly. We have to think about the two majorities that are oppressed or at least secondary citizens in sub-Saharan Africa due to the principle of seniority. These are young people and especially uh, female. So people are leaving the villages and those people leaving are the young. Given a chance, you're a young person, you leave, you rather play and lose than not play at all. Uh, maybe there's some sort of lottery mentality. So people do not necessarily move because they uh, are expecting that they will live, be live better in, uh, in a shanty town in Lagos or in Nairobi or in Johannesburg, but they expect things to be more open and then they have their chance and they are hunting chances. And so this is this lottery mentality. By moving young people, moving from the, the villages to the towns, and I keep repeating shanty towns, two thirds of the cities in Africa are shanty towns. So it is not that that is a small percentage of, of the towns. That, that, that is just the reality. And it's your foothold in the urban environment for a young person, you would start out in a, a shanty town. So you have these young people 
moving massively from the villages into the towns. And then they are first in a provincial town, then they may move on to the capital, and then they move on to a regional uh, uh, capital. So they move on to some regional powerhouse. And you could think of it as the widening terraces of a migratory fountain. What, what needs to happen for this for these terraces of uh, uh, the widening terraces of that migratory fountain to eventually spill over, if I can call it that way, from uh, the continent and affect neighboring Europe. There are three conditions. The first condition is you need a vision of the world. You have to have an orientation of the, the world. This is more and more provided by, it started with satellite telephone. Today, the continent is covered by cellular phone, telephony, and half of African countries already have 4G tele technology. So people are totally with it. The second condition for uh, a massive departure uh, are diasporic communities communities that are already abroad because they lower the cost of installation, the cost of you getting into a, a new country. So the third and the most important condition for people to move is that they need to turn a first corner, corner of prosperity. There is no, it is not the poorest who move, it is the emerging middle class that moves. So this is the open question. Has Africa already reached that threshold of a first um, level of prosperity that makes it possible for, for uh, uh, an increasing number of Africans to, uh, to travel. Today, the emerging middle class in Africa is roughly 150 to 200 million people out of the 1.3. So there will be five young Africans, two of them under the age of 15, and one European roughly the age of 50. This is the migratory pressure that Europe will be looking for. It is clear that there will be migration, and whether it's good or bad for Africa, there will be migration nonetheless. But there is a discourse saying that in actuality, in migration, the brain drain is a brain gain, and that it would be advantageous for Africa. I do not share that at all. I don't think that is true. These people who are running away, who are leaving, who are defeatist about the future of Africa, so they are the first to actually you know, emerge out of poverty. What effect does that have to the people who are not yet, have not yet turned the corner of prosperity? We think of migration very often, there are three phases to migration. We think only of the middle part, the heroic part when an individual tries to overcome obstacles and to get into a promised land, and we want to support that. But there are two other moments. The first moment is the moment of abandonment when people actually leave their national community and go away, and that's less heroic, and we should take that into account. And then there's the third moment, we're quite na naive about that as well, we think or Europeans easily think, as Europe is this developed, prosperous place, as soon as you touch Europe, you're happy. People are not happy. I think there are three principles that you have to bear in mind and that, that you have to respect. The first principle I already mentioned, I think you cannot wish away the states. Uh, there is no ethnic or religious or whatever precondition. It is just citizenship, whether you're white, you are black, you're brown, it doesn't matter. If you're European, you decide who's getting into Europe. You can't count without your host. That's a very uh, sound principle. Uh, and uh, only Europeans can decide who enters Europe. But they cannot decide in the void. And the second principle is that a border is not a barrier. A border is a space of negotiation between neighbors who cannot disregard the problems of the other side. The third principle, which is the least perceived and the one that I'm most insisting on, is the fact that we still think in yesterday's world. We think about the rich northern countries and the poor southern countries. That's no longer the world we are living in. Social uh, inequality is exploding among those who are the winners and the losers of globalization. And as long as the winners and, uh, of globalization in Europe, in the United States, and in Africa, and I will come back to that in one second, as long as they don't care, take care of the losers of globalization, we will be all losers.